Well, hey, Off-Road Junkies, you know I'm a huge fan of off-road shows, and we've got several out here in the Pacific Northwest that I go to each and every year. Well, this particular event caught my eye, definitely got on my radar, and I had to reach out to the folks who uh, basically run this event behind it uh, for an interview, see if we can find out more about it. And I do have here, not in studio this time around, but over the phone, live via, well, wherever he's at, somewhere on the globe, uh, I've got the founder, the president of Trail Hero, Rich Klein, on the phone. Rich, Thanks so much for taking the time. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Now, this event that you have going on is in Utah, but uh, off the air, you said that you were in Alaska right now. What are you doing up there? <laughs> yeah, so I'm actually a project manager in Alaska in the oil and gas industry. And uh, you know, my, my regular job is managing projects that are anywhere between $3 million and $6 billion, uh, in revenue. And... So, uh, no pressure to an event, you know, no pressure. We're, yeah. we're good to go. I was going to say Alaska is a far cry from Utah as far as uh, weather and everything else goes. I uh, got to be a little bit of a culture shock for you. It is, you know, uh, in the summertime, I will like right now it's, uh, below it's below freezing right now and I'll go home and it'll be 110 degrees. Uh, the, the summer temperatures back home and in, in St. George, Utah get to be pretty hot. So that that change is pretty drastic. Yeah, I bet. So, uh, Utah is, or Georgia rather, is that where you hail from? Uh, I actually, I'm from born and raised in California Oh wow! and just happened to move out to Utah at one point throughout my, uh, throughout high school and got to love the area. And when we had lived in Alaska, my wife who was born and raised in Alaska asked me, you know, I want to get out. Where should we go? And, I knew the perfect place, and that was St. George. <laughs> just good family ah, oriented George. people, and uh, yeah, just a lot of a lot of good times out there. Very good, very good. So, uh, with an event like this, it's got to come a very long standing background of off roading. I want to know how you kind of got into this whole sport to begin with, uh, and how long you've been into it. How long you've been an off road nut? Well, you know, it's interesting. I grew up um, on the Rubicon, being in Northern California. The Rubicon was our backyard. In fact, uh, the Lucky town guy. I'm from is Placerville. Yeah, Placerville, California. So, um, you know, every weekend my dad and I would go out in a CJ5 and we'd hit the Rubicon and camp. And I got to know a lot of the wheelers. And I started, I got my first rollover at three years old. And uh, <laughs> there's yeah. not a lot of people that have bragging rights like that, really. <laughs> right. And then so, um, you know, that's really where it started for me and, and it started for my dad even earlier than that. And uh, it's kind of just been ongoing in our family. But as far as an event is concerned, um, my dad actually started a competition rock crawling series called Cal Rocks back in, I think it was 2001. And I had been more or less helping him with the Cal Rocks events. Eventually, he and I came up with this concept of We Rock. And We Rock is the World Extreme Rock Crawling Championship Series. And so at one point, we had 13 different countries all under our sanctioning body. I wrote the rules for the sport, uh, designed the courses, built man-made obstacles all over the world in 22 different locations for anything from the Chinese government to the state of California to uh, counties in Arizona. And the idea was to really expand the sport of rock crawling itself. And, uh, you know, with that, came a ton of experience in how to hold events and uh, I had been holding rock crawling events in particular for about 10 years uh, and then from there um, we'd also held desert races with at one time that he and I owned uh, Vora which is Valley Off-Road Racing Association. Um, I started the concept called Dirt Riot which is uh, very similar to Ultra 4 and King of the Hammers except it's yeah no um, we actually uh, and one of the a, one of the segments of our of our show, we actually report about events and and things like that, and and uh, yeah, some of the we rock competitions and and dirt riot and stuff like yeah. that. That's all been on our radar for quite some time. That's funny. We actually uh, talk about those events. Uh, you know, make sure that people are aware of those sort of things to get the awareness out. Make sure that people have a, a place to go that are interested in off road racing and and the sport as a whole as a spectator when they can't uh, when they can't get their fix as a driver. Yeah, you know. A lot of people that, and we we design it this way. We want them to focus on the drivers. The drivers are the heroes of our sport, and make you know that real connection between what a vehicle can do and what our average guy 
at home wants to be able to do. And I just happen to be one of the guys behind the scenes, um, kind of organizing that whole effort. In about 2011, um, I decided to uh, sell my controlling interest and move to Alaska. And kind of just uh, off the whim, my wife wanted to uh, try something new, and off we went. Now let's so, back. Well, hold on a second, Rich. Let me back, backtrack just a second. When you say sell your controlling interest. Was that in 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 We Rock, or what was that in? That was in We Rock in Dirt Riot. Okay, so you, Dirt Riot has just been a concept at that point. Oh, I see. Okay, so you you kind of gave up the reins to We We Rock to uh, to pursue other interests. Correct, and it was you know my my father and I put it together, so it was an easy sale. Um, well, I was going to say, yeah, something something that was started with your dad like that, and and has some deep roots, you know, where even that came yeah. from. Uh, that had to have been hard to let go. Uh, it was, you know, and when you get out of the industry um, and essentially change your entire life, you have to cut yourself off, in my opinion, and, and it was difficult to do. You know, I, I went to my first rock crawling event in 1998 at the Warren Nationals. Um, my dad actually opened up Three Peaks Recreational Area in Cedar City, Utah to be used for, you know, wheeling and all sorts of different stuff. And so, you know, we've been around for a long time. Well, I was going to say, that's um, quite the been, legacy, yeah. Every, yeah, just about every rock crawling event we had attended or competed in. And so when it came to organizing our own, uh, we were, you know, essentially enthusiasts and drivers, and we wanted to build something for the driver, you know. And originally, the sport of rock crawling was was built around that. And, you know, some people came in and kind of had their own version, and it was more based on money and the promoter, and that's good for the sport to an extent. But it really, a lot of it was done for the wrong reasons, and, uh, you know, we kind of changed that whole uh, misconception of of sport no you really did i mean it. you you changed the dynamic of it you embodied the spirit of of sort of how this whole thing came to be which is you know the family aspect the togetherness the the stewardship of the of the land and, and everything else and really you know took that and ran with it yeah you know and that was our number one goal when we first started building we rock and we rock still a uh, thriving entity today i think they just had a record number of attendance in the last over the last seven years, uh, they just received their highest number of attendance in both spectators and drivers in the unlimited class. So I think, you know, rock crawling's back. Um, a lot of people, they re-geared and went to the go fast stuff, and that was great. Um, sometimes that's getting a little too out of hand with the, the budgets. It can be difficult. Yeah, I've seen Although some I've seen some of those fun. cars. Seriously, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, some of those teams, oh, yeah, it's I, like they got you got way too much money over there. What are you doing? Yeah, and, you know, we, we had had a hand in the beginning stages of uh, Ultra 4 or King of the Hammers was, you know, before Ultra 4. And yeah. what a lot of people don't realize is the first major Ultra 4 film that came out, I actually filmed that from the helicopter. Um, Wait, so you were the guy holding the camera? I was the guy holding the camera. So I also it's, wrote the rules for it. So it's your fault. The it, it, I, it's your fault that I have this addiction is what I'm hearing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I've been around for a while and kind of driven the sport into the direction we want to go, and uh, it's it's been great. Yeah, no, I imagine uh, with that comes a lot of very unique experiences. Well, for instance, like hanging out the side of a helicopter with a video camera, uh, you know, filming the sport that you love so very much. I, I mean, that that had to have been one of one of the greatest moments I would have to imagine throughout this. It is, and you know, you look at the, some of the other opportunities that sprung. Um, I. I built a off-road park and vehicle platform for the Chinese government for search and rescue re- missions. Um, was it as, a, as like a training, training, as a training facility, bit more or less, or or what? It, yeah, absolutely. I built a training facility, built an assembly line, uh, built a vehicle platform so that they're assembling their own vehicles using American-made parts, and they're training their their officials or their their crew to do search and rescue missions with these four-wheel drive vehicles in China, and. Uh, you're saving you're saving really lives important. abroad. I mean, let's let's face it. <laughs> really, though, I mean, you know that kind of that kind of experience, that kind of training 
unless you have the ability to to put your 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 people into that kind of situation, you can't you can't really impart that kind of training onto onto people. And so when you can get search and no. rescue out in the places that you ordinarily wouldn't have been, or in scenarios where you ordinarily wouldn't have been able to get vehicles, and now you can, uh, you know, you you essentially are saving lives at that point. Well, yeah, and you know, it stemmed off of we had built this vehicle platform and this concept and sent it out to all these different countries and uh, nobody bought it. And it took a couple of years and next thing you know, the tsunami hit Japan and Mm -hmm. Fukushima and all that stuff happened. And the savior for people wasn't the, you know, the ambulance services and the helicopters because they just didn't have the infrastructure for it. So what happened was the local four wheel drive clubs, would drive over the rubble and get to people so that they could load them up in the back of their truck or their samurais yeah. or their vehicles and take them to the hospital. And that got worldwide attention. And at that point, uh, we had a lot more interest in the program. I, I every now and again, a- a- am privileged to uh, impart some of these feel good Jeep stories where I hear about these off-road clubs or these Jeep clubs or whatnot, who like in the dead of winter, when the, when the city has been iced in for a week, you know, these guys are out there, you know, they're saving people who, who venture out when they absolutely have to, they're shuttling people to yeah. the hospitals to, you know, make their appointments and stuff, that kind of stuff. I mean, that, that embodies the spirit of the off-road brotherhood just to the nth degree. And it, I just love hearing about that kind of stuff. So to, to hear that kind of stuff, you, you know, become cap- uh, become possible more out, you know, in, in on a global platform means that, that this is not just, you know, some sport for a bunch of dumb hicks over here in the States. You know, this is this is a global entity and, and, it, and it has a heartbeat. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people don't realize how much the society as a whole actually needs four wheel drive vehicles. Um, if you think about the opportunity that that affords people, not just in a search and rescue type mission, because that's kind of a sometimes maybe a once in a lifetime mm-hmm. opportunity itself. But, yeah. uh, you know, a lot of these, a lot of people that need to get outdoors or want to get outdoors don't have the ability to jump on a horse or go for a hike or go mountain bike riding. You know, they need four wheel drive access. And, and that's what this industry provides. You know, it's not just a bunch of rednecks running around. It's, you know, hardcore enthusiasts that have a love for the land of America and want to provide opportunities to, you know, people with special needs or our veterans, you know, people that need that access or fought for their lives for that access. Now they have the ability to, to do that. Well, I'm glad you used that word access because that's one thing. I mean, I I stand behind uh, the tread lightly principles. I'm a tread lightly uh, tread trainer out here in Oregon, and uh, having you know something like this to have the the a body bigger than just you know a couple guys in their jeeps or something like that. Having this this body that is putting forth this event and an event unlike anything that we've seen before, mind you. And creating the the level of access that's been unprecedented to an event like this as well really is is one of the reasons why I reached out to you as soon as I found out about you. Yeah, you know, our goal is to raise awareness. And right now, when you look at our industry and our land use battle, uh, when people, when land is taken away from us, land is taken away from the public perception is it's just being taken away from a bunch of rednecks, like you said earlier, or Hicks or whatever. And we want to regear that, um, yeah. you know, with inclusion of, you know, people that have mental or physical disabilities, giving them the opportunity to get out on the trail. And there's a lot of groups out there that are currently doing that. Right? This isn't a new concept by any means. And, the same thing with our, our Veterans Day. We've got you know two theme days of the event, um, our Vets and Military Access Day. We want to get broaden our horizon, get more people involved, offer more opportunities out there. And what it, essentially that ha- does is when somebody goes to take land away from us, now they're taking land not just from a bunch of rednecks, but people that need that access to be able to, to explore the outdoors, uh, people that fought for their lives for that access. and you know, there's something that a lot of people don't touch on in this this whole battle, and that's called the Americans with Disability Act. And there's actually a section in that act that states that that opportunity must be afforded to all parties with disabilities. And if you take away four-wheel drive access or, auto, you know, motorized access, 
now those people, the same people that can't ride a horse or go for a hike or jump on a bike, they don't have the ability to see that or experience that. And so you're taking away something that is law. We don't use that in our land use fight at all. Yeah, that's that's a really good point there, and and brings me to to one of the one of the standing shining points of of this whole event is is the special needs access and the veterans access that you have uh, for this. Now, the two completely different meanings of access, but kind of embodies the same spirit and sense. The special needs access was one that really touched my heart. This one kind of tugged at my heartstrings a little bit because uh, this is just, it, it's so honorable that you, that this, this facet is getting so much attention during this event. Can you, can you touch on a little bit about that? Sure. Well, you know, I would say probably at this point, nine or 10 years ago, I had the opportunity to get on this run called the Disabled Sports Run on the Rubicon. And there's a, a gentleman out of truck named Jason Berger that held that run. And it really tried, kind of changed my outlook. Um, I went with people that had mental and physical disabilities and gave them, you know, a, a overnight camping trip on the Rubicon. And my job on that trip was wow. to just document and write an article, more or less, and just kind wow. of absorb it and experience it. And it was it was absolutely phenomenal. I was going to say that had to have been overwhelming. I mean, to, to be in the oh, role yeah. that you were for that, I mean, that, that had to have been overwhelming. All right. And so what, you know, that experience for me was something that I wanted to be able to afford other people that are similar to me, but I also wanted to afford that to people local to the, you know, St. George area. There's a lot of people that don't get that opportunity and it just didn't seem right. So what we did is we teamed up with the Desert Rose and Trail Society and the St. George Jeepers, which are two different clubs uh, down in southern Utah. And we've put together a big luncheon on the Wednesday of our event. It's October 5th. And um, for that access itself, which we have other trails as well for riders, but um, we'll do this big luncheon. We'll go run the East Rim Trail and, uh, and kind of you know afford that opportunity to uh, access our lands and enjoy the outdoors just like anybody else would. Yeah, that, that is amazing. Uh, and then the, the veterans, the veterans access as well. This is something that, that I thought was really cool. Not just, you know, I mean, everybody gets into this event for free to begin with that. That's a, that's cool unto itself. But then you go ahead and say, veterans, why don't you guys go ahead and bring your rigs? And, and I thought that yeah. was, that was pretty cool as well. So let, let's talk about what you guys are doing for the veterans above and beyond. Well, so that's a pretty unique um, setup for us. You know, we wanted to work with a group that had great publicity and good um, morals, you know, and you, you, there's a couple groups out there right now that more or less take advantage of the veterans, and we didn't want that at all. Yeah. Um, in fact, we're not, when we put this together, we're not even allowing sponsorship of this part of the event, this is just something that we're doing because we want to do it and there's no branding involved with it. No, none of that. We don't want anybody to take advantage of this situation. And so the idea is we work, we're working with the wheelers for the wounded out of California. Yep. And, you know, a personal friend of mine is, is a gentleman named Kevin Carey. He's had a huge impact on my life growing up and wheeling and, and he's a veteran himself. And, uh, I think he's out of the airborne division and, you know, what he does is he puts together, or their group puts together, these overnight camping trips out on the Rubicon. And they've expanded their their work or their network to uh, different states, and Utah's a state that they're not in yet. So they wanted to be able to expand to Utah. And they run 100% off of donation. They don't take anything um you know, for themselves, essentially every, yeah. every dollar that's donated goes straight to the veterans effort. Nobody pockets anything. Nobody uses, you know, that as a springboard for anything. And that to me is doing it for the right reason. Absolutely. You know? So what they're doing is we're putting together a group of five um, combat or purple heart vets, and they are taking them out on the trail within sand hollow and that's you know a chauffeured uh trip essentially and on top of that if you are a veteran or active military and you show your proof of id or of service uh and you have your own rig you can wheel on thursday free of charge whatever trail you want and we'll do everything we can to accommodate you and just 
it's our way of saying thank you. And I know it's, it's never enough for the sacrifice that they've put together, but you know, at least it's a step in the right direction. And, uh, and my grandpa, he was career military and I just want to, I want to be able to, to help out as much as I can. Yeah. And that, that is awesome. And, and it definitely, uh, one amazing opportunity, uh, to get, uh, you know, get their rigs out on, on such picturesque, you know, scenery and, and world-class trails. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Sand hollow itself, um, down in St. George, it, it, it's amazing how this location is virtually untouched. There's an, a great event called winter four by four jamboree mm-hmm. uh, that happens every January. And, that's the only real uh, rock crawling style event that's in the area. And they've done a really good job with that event. Um, but it, it, the, the location itself is still relatively unknown. It's more of a locals only place. And, you know, if you look at the facility of Sand Hollow, it's attached to a, a lake with over 600 primitive camping spots. Um, it's, a, you know, I think it's six miles in diameter on the lake there, um, or circumference, sorry, six miles in circumference. And right next to that, you can see from the rocks is a five star 18 hole golf course, San Paulo resort, you know? And so essentially three miles from downtown hurricane Utah, you can go, you can stay in your hotel, you can drive your buggy from downtown hurricane without being hassled by the cops out to sand hollow. You can go wheeling all day. When you get hot, you can go down to the lake, relax, throw the kids in the lake, have a good time. When you're done, you can go play around the golf or go relax in their clubhouse. And man, you're living like a king. It's really the only five star resort, in my opinion, where you can do this and have the support of the community. You know, that there's great aspects of Moab that entail very similar uh, features. However, there's a lot of negative, uh, focus with the Moab Easter Jeep Safari, not necessarily their event. They hold an amazing event, mm-hmm. but you know, there's businesses that are part of Moab and they don't want four wheel drive access there. They're exclusionists. They're not necessarily environmentalists. And, you know, we don't have that kind of problem, at least yet in hurricane, you know, we've got full support of the entire town. Uh, they've been extremely gracious for us and, uh, just no, it's so- cool to see. It sounds like an off-roader's paradise is what it sounds like. I mean, it just, it almost sounds too good to be true. I'm waiting for the, the butt or w- where's the catch, you know, <laughs> it's, I keep waiting for the, there, for the catch 22 and there's, and it doesn't sound like there is one. There isn't, you know, you get, if you, if you look at the, the area in general, you know, there's a Walmart two miles away from the rocks. There's 10 miles away as a city with St. George, Utah, that's got, you know, 90,000 people in it and all the amenities you could ever want. Um, splash pads for the kids, laser tag, golf carts, um, or go-karts and all that kind of stuff. And it's all just a real, you know, family friendly area. You know, you can pretty much do what you wish out there. And it kind of takes you back in time when we had a little bit more liberty and freedom with our land. And, uh, before, you know, people started trying to take it away from us. Yeah, and that's really what this event is all about, is is gaining awareness for the stewardship of the land, for keeping public access open, for keeping us able to use our public lands as we see fit, like, for instance, you know, tra- off-road trails and, and, you know, off-roading, you know, all that sort of stuff. And, and this really is, is taking that to another level with the level of access that you're providing with making this a, a very much a spectator focused type of sport, uh, or event rather, uh, by, you know, making sure that anybody and everybody can attend and, and opening up the doors for anybody. And, and Rich, I really want to get into the nuts and bolts of this event. Now, this is a four, four day event. Am I right? Yeah. So you're looking at, um, over the four days, you've got, 80, over 80 trails that we are providing and they are literally from dead completely stock four-wheel drive vehicles mm-hmm. we offer trails for those all the way up to the most capable buggies in the world and on top of that when you're done with each day of your trails you get industry entertainment free of charge all you got to do is run over to the rocks we're doing it kick back and relax and and have a good show so yeah, yeah. the idea was we, we put together 
the, the biggest players in the industry all in one location. You know, you've got We Rock that does their national or international rock crawling. Um, in fact, they're, they're bringing over, uh, you know, Masa Nori Suda, which is, uh, from Japan. He's one of the Japan, We Rock Japan drivers. He's coming over to compete. Then you also have Ultra Four. They're doing an endurance race at, at the park at the same time. And so it's kind of like a, uh, motorsports mecca event. You know, yeah, it really is. It, it's, I mean, yeah. you've got all these different facets that are all happening all at the same time. Now, on your website, you've got uh, you've got a, a, an image here that says the numbers of Trail Hero. And uh, we've got over 700 vehicles, I'm going to assume, which are already registered and probably more happening by the day. 60 vendor booths. That's a lot of vendors. That is awesome. 82 yeah. trails in four days. 70 race efforts, meaning there's going to be 70 different racers in various different competitions, different races and happening all at the same time. I mean, this, this is, if you want to get your, your off-road fix for the year, good Lord, this is definitely the spot to come. You, you really put it, you know, in the right words, this is an off-road Mecca event with bringing so much of this stuff together. You know, we really wanted to focus on the promotion of the entire sport, you know, and there's so many different facets of the sport. You've got your expedition guys, you've got your trail guys, you've got your rock crawlers, your racers, the guys that do like the rock racing, the bounty type obstacles. Right. And we wanted to kind of bring all that together in one location. So, you know, when it comes to trails, you got four days of that. When it comes to expedition type uh, trails, you've got the ability to go to the edge of the Grand Canyon camp overnight as an actual guided trail. You don't see oh, that wow. anywhere. No. Um, you know, at the same point, you can run over to our Bounty Obstacle, which is sponsored by Low Range and Red Desert Off-Road, and they've put together a $2,000 purse, and anybody can enter. So, essentially, for a $10 entrance fee to compete, that's all it takes. You get a single 10-minute attempt at that course, and you can do it as many times as you want for 10 bucks. And so, if you get a good score and somebody else gets a better time on that course than you do, you can go back in, pay another ten dollars and try to run it faster. That's um, awesome. <laughs> every one of those ten dollars that you that people pay to participate in that, and they don't have to be a trail rider to do it. It could be a local guy that comes out and doesn't yeah. participate at all. Every bit of that ten dollars goes straight to Utah Public Lands Alliance. And those are the guys that are really fighting to keep our southern Utah trails open. Yeah, you've, I was going to say, you're going to have to have people that, that have a little bit more connections than you that, that, um, you know, are in the, in the position to make things happen in that regard that, you know, this is, this is what they do. I was going to ask you about the, 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 those, those bodies above you, like, you know, the, uh, the Utah four wheel drive association and, and these others that are, are really handling the, the red tape aspect of it all behind the scenes. Can you, can you give a little shout out to some of those guys and the, you know, the sponsors that are really making the stuff happen for the rest of us? Yeah. You know, um, you look at guys that, 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 in my opinion, they're the power stewards. There are ambassadors when it comes to the legal issues and battles and land you know, exclusions. And for us, you know, Utah Four Wheel Drive Association does a huge amount of work for all of Utah um, specifically to the Southern Utah region and where our primary focus is for our event, even though we are working with, you know, Utah Four Wheel Drive Association, we're also working with UPLA and that's Utah Public Lands Alliance. Well, yeah, and cause it, 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 it's going to take more than just, you know, one little friendship, you know, it's going to take, exactly. you know, several bodies all working for this, you know, a common cause to make, you know, lasting things happen. Right. And, you know, it's kind of an amazing deal We're, with getting all these big players involved. Um, you know, the, that winter 4x4 Jamboree, the Desert Rats put that on. And last year they donated $40,000 to UPLA. That's amazing. You know, that's huge. Yeah. I, I hope to be able to do the same thing, really. Um, you know, and then on top of that, Utah Full Drive Association had a charitable raffle where you, know, you could buy tickets, everything goes to to the cause and get a chance to win some pretty cool prizes, sets of tires, winches, you know, you name it. Oh, these aren't um, just stickers that we're, we're raffling off folks or winches, tires. You know, uh, he's breaking out the big guns here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for the buggy guys, they have a chance at winning a set of brand new 42 inch Maxxis tires. They're oh, not wow. even available to the public yet. And they have a chance to win them. That's amazing. Um, and 
if you're, you know, a guy that's just getting into the sport, you can get the same uh, set of tires, except you don't have to get the 42s. You can get a, you know, the 35 inch buckhorns Mm -hmm. or say you've got tires and you want tires for your tow rig. Well, you can take that and buy tires for your tow rig instead. Maxxis makes tires for every, literally every application possible. So, you know, there's no way that that's going to go to a waste. You, you pick what you want out of it. Now, speaking of Maxxis, so, they're, they're just one of, of many sponsors uh, for this event. I mean, your, your list is long. I mean, the, the sponsors page that you have there has some very, very familiar names uh, in it. I mean, from TNT Customs to... I mean, you've got you've got Maxis on there. You've got so many big names in the sports uh, th- that's behind you for this thing. It's absolutely mind boggling, uh, but not at the same time. It's not surprising because it's such a good cause and it's such a beautiful area and and it is such uh, you know uh, so much diverse terrain out there. Uh, it's not surprising they would get behind you on this. Well, you know the the event has been received very well from the industry. Uh, there's a lot of excitement. We've got a lot of momentum going. And even though this is a first year event, um, it's not my first year putting on events. And all these companies are very familiar with the work I've done in the past and the work I currently do now. And so, you know, it, it makes it a little easier to come on board than, you know, your typical club event or something like that, you know, and one of the other things that is pretty cool is that we've got television coverage coming out and how many trail rides can say that, you know, Spike TV is going to be there with two full episodes and we've got live coverage happening and for a trail ride that is virtually unheard of, you know? And so a lot of these sponsors are getting pretty good brand exposure over it as well. Um, and we've specifically decided to work with uh, sponsors or companies out there that are, are you know, in good graces with the public, we we want the entire industry to flourish, and we don't we won't shut anybody out. But the people that are working with us, they're really good, reputable companies. And when I work with a company, I want to make sure that it's the right thing for anybody. You know, and I can put together a real recommendation for them, not just take their money and and let them be at the event. I'm not really into that. Um, to me, there's more value in making sure that when, when our riders decide to work with a company that helps us out at the event, that they're actually working with the company that does what they say they're going to do, you know, that provides a good quality product in a timely manner. Uh, that's all very important to our industry. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's one thing to have, uh, you know, a ton of names behind you, but if they all got a bad reputation, well, that's not necessarily a good thing. Yeah, yeah, and there's a, there's a couple companies out there that that do have that bad rep, and well, know, there's going to be bad apples in every bunch. You know, you kind of got to take the exactly. a little bit of that bad with the good, but it's the good that I wanted to focus on for this next question because you have <laughs> yeah. you have this you have this uh, one of these aspects of this of this four day event. And there's I mean, there's so much going on in this event, but this is one of the things that stood out to me: this Rock Sports Gala. And now this sounds like, like really something that, that, you know, a lot of people could get into. Yeah. It's kind of the sports first VIP high end clientele effort towards, um, establishing that we're more than just a bunch of rednecks. Uh, essentially when we do something on that kind of level, it's always piggybacked with other events, uh, whether it be off-road expo or SEMA, and mm-hmm. that's good for the sport. The cross promotion is important, but Absolutely. we don't have anything to call our own in that manner. And so, you know, we put together this effort and we'll be taking over the clubhouse at Sand Hollow Resort and it'll be a full catered dinner. Uh, we'll have 200 guests there and live music. We'll have uh, a state of the union from the top promoters and we'll be doing a very special thank you to our veterans that are uh, with our wheelers for the wounded. And so, you know, it's kind of a, uh, just a who's who of not just industry players and large companies, but you'll have, you know, your local government officials there that will be, you know, all kind of embracing the fact of look what we built. And, you know, this is something that's beyond cool, something that, you know, has really never happened before. Now, is this something that's open to anybody or everybody? You said, uh, you know, 200 uh, seats or something like that. Now, is, is this something for vendors only or what's this going to be like? Well, it 
essentially it is based on uh, if you're able to get a pass. <laughs> right. So, um, you know, we ha- we do have a limit of 200 people. That's just due to fire code. Um, if we could invite everyone, we would, trust me. But, uh, you know, we are somewhat limited there. However, um, if you're able to get a pass, you're going to be able to experience those things. And it is kind of geared towards... Um, you know, using this as a business to business or a racer to business. Uh, well, when you're marketing. when you're bringing so much of the industry together in one place, you got to be able to be like, okay, let's do something for you know the networking side of it. We there is a, a great deal of business. After all, this is like a five billion dollar a year industry. I mean, you can't ignore the right. business side of that. And so, giving giving an outlet for for that really you know shows a degree of professionalism when it comes when it comes to event organization which you know brings me to my next uh, thing this is the one thing I, I really wanted to to highlight on is this aspect that you have uh, called the trail breaker and this yeah. this sounds like the end all be all of spectator events i mean c- can you can you highlight what this thing is and how it came to be well you know the uh, trail breaker is kind of a unique event in that if you look at the way rock crawling, our roots of rock crawling was built, it was trail riding, you know, and, and when I go trail riding with my buddies, it's, did I make that? Did he make it easier? Did, it, you know, did I struggle a little bit more? Mm-hmm. Um, and for us, we're always trying to do harder and more challenging terrain and kind of just, you know, conquer, you know, the different trails out there and what, you know, the hardest obstacles on those trails. The unique thing about Sand Hollow and this land that's managed by BLM is that they are giving us the opportunity with a GPS route to actually break open a brand new trail. Oh, that is awesome. And I've worked really good. Yeah, and it's the BLM. And I know that BLM has a lot of negative uh, publicity right now. So and it deserves it. N- well, but yeah, this rightly BLM so. The BLM office has been phenomenal. Yeah. So let me This I- particular BLM office has been awesome to work with. I've experienced a little bit of that behind the scenes. I got a chance to design a trail up here in the uh, in the Tillamook State Forest, and I got to work with the Oregon Department of Forestry, you know, hand in hand with this. And one of the biggest obstacles for getting a new trail cut is is the environmental stuff behind it. Like, how did you get past the the environmental impact studies and things like that? All the red tape that would prevent this sort of thing from happening more commonplace. Well, it's, a lot of it has to do with that entity that I talked about earlier, and that's Utah Public Lands Alliance. Um, they they more or less forge the way for us. And then when you bring them into the fight and then you look at the history that I've got within the industry of building terrain, um, and not just for, you know, private entities, but actually for the state of California. You know, I built the... Uh, the area down in Akatia Wells. I don't know if you're familiar with the Tierra del Sol event, but they had yeah. they had built an off road park there. And I'm actually the guy who, who built that with my friend Josh England. <laughs> well you got and, quite the legacy as far as one of the off road parks you've built, man. That's a, yeah. that is impressive. That's pretty cool. And so um, you know, a lot of hard work went into that. And no, I can only Josh imagine we put in put together a lot of different sites, but um you know, the fact that I have that experience and I've, I've built more than just, you know, a rubble and a rock, that helps a lot with the ability to do something unique like this. And they gave us the opportunity to do it. And it just seemed like a no brainer. This is our first honest effort to put together something that is, that really reaches back into the roots of rock crawling and puts the best drivers on a single course or a single trail at one specific time, which I don't know if if it's actually ever been done before, as far as, you know, just the best drivers coming together and running a trail. And you've you've got a couple guys that have tried it, you know, Moab with the Black Flag, um, part of Area BFE that Kevin Carroll and Tracy Jordan and a few guys kind of put together. Um, But this is a competition essentially based around that. Well, yeah, you've, I mean, you've got, you've got the list of who's who's as far as off-road racing goes. And you're going to, you're going to bring these guys, their world-class rigs on on what has to be one of the world's toughest trails and be like, all right, boys, good luck. (laughs) And that's, you know, yeah, really. And, and this is not, this is going to be one of your free spectator events, but this is also going to be televised through Spike TV's Extreme 4x4, right? Exactly. And 
So, uh, you know, we've got together our, a driver committee and the drivers are making the rules of the event. And it's kind of a really cool concept because all these other events, the drivers don't make the rules. It's the promoter that makes the rules and the promoter that's kind of steering the course of, of you know, the race series or whatnot. And that's needed you know, when you get into big time events. But we've got 10 drivers, you know, we don't we don't need the. I don't need to get in the way of what the drivers want. I want something that the drivers built themselves, and I just want to help them, you know, provide that opportunity. So they put together rules like, you know, the guys have to have certain safety standards in place. They're not going to have spotters, which is, wow. I mean, not not having a spotter on regular trails is difficult enough. I was going to say that's a on, that's a game changer right there. Oh yeah, you're going to put them on the hardest trail in the country without a spotter. Um, so it really pits the driver in the vehicle versus the terrain and how, you know, who's really going to be the best driver, the just purest driver who's going to, who's yeah. going to be. And, you know, on top of that, that also means that there's no outside influence. So you don't have to have anybody stacking rocks when, and if you're an extreme trail rider, you know, the last thing you want to do is stack a rock. It's just kind of a pride thing. You know? No, absolutely. Um, yeah. Well, and, 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 you know, as far as competition goes, you know, during the sanctioned events that that's points lost. Right. Well, and for here, there, there's actually no points, um, as far as like judges, judges and judgment calls and cones that could get kind of convoluted, uh, difficult to follow sometimes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the sport of rock crawling, particularly we rock, they've done a really good job in clarifying the rules as well as possible. But we want to take that human element out just to see what happens um, and make it really, you know, the, the vehicle and the driver versus terrain. And the other cool part is none of the drivers are allowed to watch each other attempt the obstacle. Oh, they essentially wow. are doing it blind. Now that's, that's a whole nother dynamic that I never would have thought of. That really adds, I mean, really another degree of sportsmanship that they have to, I mean, th that really is going to epitomize what's going to make a good driver better than the next driver. That, right. that is, <laughs> that is great. I was, I, you know, I was thinking uh, things are going to go a different direction when you, when you give a bunch of off-road racers the free reins of our, all right, guys, what's the rules going to be? And everybody looks kind of over at the next guy. Now I'm fine with no rules of you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, all right. Yeah. For something like oh, this, yeah. that's kind of the way I thought it would end up end up going. But at the same time, I'm not surprised that they really bucked down, took this seriously, and 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 started to make this, you know, uh, put rules around this to make it a very unique event. And it sounds like it's going to be. Well, and you know, some of these guys they've been competitive rock crawling for years, and, yeah. and in their locale, they are the best guys out there. And it's interesting, you you know, a lot of the hardcore guys they. They want to go do the hardest trail and they talk a big game on the internet. And then when it comes time to doing the hardcore trail, they, you know, they have a little bit to lack there. And so, um, what these drivers essentially wanted to do is say, okay, you know, here is the hardest trail in the country. Who can actually do it? Mm -hmm. You know, who is actually the best? No, there's yeah. going to be a, a lot of competition between the drivers. I mean, it just, you know, by the time the last guy runs, okay, you know, whose time's got the, you know, is there going to, are they going to know what their times are? Is there going to be a, is it going to be timed or is it just like, all right, if anyone, if anybody's able to complete this, you know, you're good to go. Yeah. So the way it's set up is this trail is essentially broken into three segments or what we call, um, stages. And so in each stage is a minimum of three obstacles and you get points awarded to you for each obstacle that you complete. Okay. And the more difficult obstacles that you, um, that you actually are able to complete in the trail, the, the higher the point value. So for instance, on the very first stage, the very first obstacle, it's probably the gatekeeper or more or less. It's the hardest obstacle on that trail. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's worth a hundred points. The very next obstacle is worth 70 and the obstacle after that is worth 50. And so, you, you've got these guys that they've got a 15 minute time limit to make it through all three obstacles. And this is no joke. It's if you've been to a rock crawling event, it is the hardest terrain ever featured in any rock crawling event ever put together all in one trail. Goodness. And it's, it is no joke. 
Well, and it sounds like from a spectator standpoint, they're going to get their dessert first. Yeah, you know, it's going to be um, it's going to be pretty awesome to watch because you have an immense amount of traction out of San Paulo, and vehicles can already do the unthinkable out there. And now you're going to put them in positions where they're really pushing it, and you've got all the best technology, and you've got the best drivers, and you've got the best strategy. It's going to be interesting to watch for sure. Now, uh, you said something about judges and, and stuff earlier. Um, is there a big need for volunteers for this event? You know, we do have a, uh, a need for volunteers. We're currently taking applications for trail guides, for judges, for the rock crawling event, staff members. Uh, we got a thing called the Energy Team, which is going to help us more or less set up and take down each one of the features within Trail Hero. And if you're going to, you know, essentially apply for that, if you go to the very bottom of our website page, uh, you'll see a, a few links underneath our sponsors um, block there. And one of the links is, is says volunteer. All you got to do is click on that and fill out the form there. That'll give us, you know, your email address, uh, your T-shirt size, which you get free T-shirts, you get uh, lunch, and and you get uh, really cool bags supplied by Spiderweb Shade Design. It'll be like this uh, trash bag that can hang off the back of your, your back tire there. And a few other gifts. We also have a volunteer-only raffle. So every aspect of the event that you volunteer with, you'll get a single raffle ticket. And if if you are helping out with every aspect, you can get you know 15 different raffle tickets, and all those can be asserted towards prizes and, and raffles within a volunteer only raffle. So that's kind of a, a cool way to give back to the people that really are making the event happen. Um, you know, sure, we've got the big promoters and everything, but the event doesn't happen without the volunteer network, and we will be relying heavily on that. No, I bet. Now, if you guys want to find out more information about how you can volunteer and how you can become a part of this event, you need to go to thetrailhero.com. Once again, that's the trailhero.com but that's not where it ends there is a lot of information there as well a lot of cool stuff some videos all the information you need about the event what it's going to entail what who's all going to be a part of it as well of course uh they are also on facebook as well uh facebook.com slash the trail hero got a bunch of good stuff over there as well um what else where else can people find you where else can they go uh where can they email to get to to get more information or to get in contact with you so as far as uh, any sponsors, uh, contacts, or volunteers, just go to the bottom of the, the website, thetrailhero.com, and there's links there that you can click on and forms to fill out. We'll get back to you as soon as possible. As far as our social networking, you know, we're on Instagram, we're on Twitter, um, all based on the Trail Hero. And I think our Twitter account is actually Trail Period Hero, but Twitter's kind of its own weird thing I'm still trying to figure out. But regardless, you know, we're, we're big into the social network uh, stuff and, you know, we want to hear from you. We want to know if, uh, if you're having problems, you know, signing up for trails or if, uh, if you just want to be a part of the event or you want to know more, you know, don't bother to, uh, to wait, just ask us. And we're more than happy to help you out, help accommodate you any way we can. Well, we'll, we'll of course be promoting a lot about the event as we get closer, uh, as the date arrives. But in the meantime, guys, please reach out to Rich and the guys over and the rest of the group over at Trail Hero. Make sure you check out their Facebook page. Make sure you like them. Uh, make sure you subscribe, all that good stuff. Uh, and be sure to check out thetrailhero.com as well. And please, if you're able to get out there in October, October 5th through the 8th in Hurricane, Utah, this is an event, guys. This is going to be one of those events that people are talking about for years to come, and uh, hopefully will be a yearly event that we see grow and get bigger and better each and every year. It sounds like it's going to be one of the best off-road events that the planet has ever seen. I can't wait to hear more about it. I can't wait to see if I can even actually get out there to be a part of this thing. Rich, this sounds awesome. If I'm not able to actually attend this event out there, but I want to help you know, let's say I'm out here in Oregon, I'm trapped out here in Oregon, I can't get to Utah, but I want to make sure that, you know, that I can help, you know, the cause that I can be a part of this event. What can I do if somebody's in my situation? If, uh, first of all, if, you, if you're trapped at home and you can't attend the event personally, you can check it out on pirate4x4.com and ihatemud.com. On top of that, we'll be doing daily updates through Crawl Zone TV, and you can catch it on 
Crawl Magazine when that comes out as well. And there's a, a couple others um, at your leisure and Dirt Every Day that are coming out and doing stuff as, as well as uh, Spike TV Extreme 4x4. But, you know, to be able to, to donate and to become essentially a trail hero itself, you know, we, we the idea is, you know, selfless acts of donation and participation. And so, um, you know, the, the best way to do that is to donate to our public land uh, fighters for us, you know. So you're going to be going through... Uh, utahpla.com um, that's Utah Public Lands Alliance and that's really if you want to donate that's a great avenue to do it another one would obviously be Utah Four Wheel Drive Association uh, they do a lot for our Utah Public Lands as well and those two uh, groups there are, are really our focus when it comes to our specific donation for the event and we suggest that if uh, if anybody wants to donate, that's the avenue that they go as well. And if nothing else, guys, you can always email Rich. Head, uh, just send an email to info at thetrailhero.com asking for more information, and he'll be sure to get you pointed in the right direction. Rich, I can't thank you enough. One, for for putting this event together. An amazing history leading up to this. Uh, and for two, thank you for so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule uh, to sit down here with the Jeep Talk Show for um, a little bit of an interview to find out more about Trail Hero. Really appreciate it. And I just appreciate you having me and uh, appreciate all the listeners tuning in. Thanks, Rich. We'll be talking to you again soon.